Professor, introduce me to yourself as an eight-year-old. Where are you living? Who are your parents? What is your childhood like at that point? I was living in Southern California in Pomona. My dad was superintendent of a state mental hospital for the mentally retarded, now called developmentally disabled. So he was a superintendent. We had a house on the hospital grounds, uh, big old Spanish house. Uh, my mom was a housewife. Um, there was an orange grove behind the house. Uh, it was kind of old, old Southern California. Yes, indeed. Which I know. Is <laughs> About the same time there. A lost world a lost in many world. ways. Um, I'm guessing a pretty nice, happy childhood in terms of circumstances. I, I don't know. I can't complain. I had a brother. We had some small number of kids in the neighborhood, so we used to run around, play outdoor sports, indoor sports, cowboys right. and Indians, baseball, football, and so on. It was a, are it was a parents, pretty good life. Are your parents the kind of people who have strong views about what, who you should be, what you should become? Are they pushing you either ethic, ethically or um, or professionally at a young age? Well, my father was a Hungarian refugee, a Jewish uh, refugee from World War II, so he lost his uh, parents and his brother in the war. He and his sister got out, um, and he was a doctor. He had to retrain himself uh, after he got to this country. He had to redo his internship and his residency. Get credentials again. Yes, essentially. yes, yes. So he met my my mother was born in the U.S. He met her in nursing school because he was teaching at the nursing school and she was there and they got married. And in those days, you couldn't be a nurse if you were married. So right. she dropped out of nursing school, married him. Then he joined the U.S. Army because he wanted to help against the Nazis. Um, so he, uh, the first thing that they did was they sent him to Utah where they had a prisoner of war camp because he spoke fluent German. So he was interviewing German prisoners of war. And then eventually he went into the Pacific Front. So he was a doctor in the Pacific Front. He never did get back to of course, that's Europe. before you were born. That was before I was born, yes. So my mom moved to San Francisco while he was in the Pacific, and then he came back, and uh, they loved California, so he moved to Southern California, got the job with the state government, and I was born there in 1948, so three years after the war. How many children do they have? One more. I have a younger brother, Jim. Bye. So the two of Four you. years younger, just the two and of us. And again, are there strong ambitions uh, in the household that you feel as a child, or are you pretty much left to develop yourself intellectually on your own? Well, I think my dad always valued intellectual achievement, on top of which he was working in this hospital for the uh, developmentally disabled. and. He was working with the psychologists and so on, so they had like intelligence tests and, all, and they tried all these things out on me. And it was scoring off the top of the charts. Yes. So he was, it was clear that what he valued was intellectual achievement, I would say. And what are you reading at this point? What are you yourself? Well, as an eight year old, I loved science fiction actually. I wanted to be the first person on Mars in those mm -hmm. days. Um, that was kind of the space age, right? So I would have been 1956 when right. I was eight years old. Do you think there's really a relationship between that kind of fascination, although so many uh, boys particularly have been interested in science fiction, and a kind of formulation of uh, thinking about the future of, of science and participating in it, or is that not really? In your view, it's related. possible. The next thing that happened to me, the way I got into mathematics and computer science, actually, well, the first thing that happened to me was my mother introduced me to the public library in Pomona, where I grew up, so I spent a lot of time reading. And then uh, I discovered Martin Gardner's column in the Scientific American Mathematical Games. That was probably when I was in fifth or sixth grade, something mm -hmm. like that. And then I became fascinated by 
mathematical games, board games, mathematics. So I sort of switched my interest from outer space to mathematics. And I, well, I went to a Episcopal school, kindergarten through sixth grade, very small, small classes, and uh, it was a wonderful environment. Then I switched into the public school in junior high school, but um, they had a tracking system, so the smart kids got really good teachers. And in particular, I had a mathematical a math teacher named Mr. Wall, who was this rotund guy who used to sit back in his chair and uh, challenge us. He gave us the new mathematics before there was such a thing as a new mathematics. He taught us pianos, axioms, and all kinds of stuff, algebra and logic and so on. So I'm sorry, he's in the Episcopal school in the public school? That was in the public school, the public school. actually, yes. So I was completely and you're getting consumed by mathematics at this point. And I got a great education, even though it was in the public school. Right. This was before Proposition 13, when California still had right. money to spend on education. And uh, I mean, it was, Pomona was not a Beverly Hills. There were plenty of Hispanics and blacks and so on. And, uh, but the education was really good. You were, you were all pushed in the direction to... Uh, yes, at, at, least, at least for those of us for those who were bright, it was a really good thing, yes. Just because it's a, a rich life and a short amount of time to talk about it, I need to get you into high school. And I need to get you into college. What, <laughs> what, what is going to, um, how is your high school shaping you? Um, what is the level of your intellectual interest, even passion at that point? Well, by the, so, my father was superintendent at the state hospital, which when he got there was basically devoted to uh, taking care of these people, but not trying to improve their lives. Yeah, kind of he warehousing. Was, yeah, warehousing. But he was interested in improving their lives, and he set up a research uh, center within the state hospital. So they were doing a lot of statistical analysis mm -hmm. and stuff. And I got a chance to actually work there during the summers. Uh, I hesitate to call it programming originally because it involved IBM punch card machines that were not even computers, but yes, yes. So I worked there every summer starting maybe eighth or ninth grade, something like that. And that kind of got me interested in pre-computers, if you will. Now you've got to make a choice for university. How are you going, how are you going about making that decision? Well, again, when I was a kid, my dad again, because he was interested in research on mentally retarded kids, he was working with Linus Pauling, who was at Caltech at the time, really? studying fetal ketonuria, which is, uh, you can't process a certain amino acid and it produces mental retardation, so you can treat it with diet. But anyway, Linus, Linus Pauling came over to the house and I played mathematical games with him, really? oh. and he left a catalog for Caltech, so uh, that was one possibility. And also, when I was in high school, I kind of ran out of math courses to take. So I started taking math courses at Harvey Mudd while I was still at, uh, in high school. So I applied to both Harvey Mudd and Caltech and ended up going to Caltech. Which was probably an easy decision. Uh, it was a bigger school. It was a little... I knew Harvey Mudd a little bit at the time. It seemed like a straightforward decision. Both very challenging right. places. I had I, if I had it to do over again, mm -hmm. I would have applied more broadly and looked at uh, liberal arts universities. I think because oh. I think I got a great education at Caltech, but it was not very rounded. It was all men at the time, right. uh, and it was incredibly. Intense. It was really challenging. High school was easy, but right. not. I don't think anybody's that, accused Caltech of that being easy. university. No. So it was a great place to be from. I made a lot of good friends. Right. But after that, I mean, grad school was relatively easy. So when when I got to uh, I got to Caltech, I was determined to be a math major. So I okay. 
was a math major, uh, but um, I'd done a lot of programming. I was in a summer science program where I did a lot of programming. I took all the stuff that passed for computer science courses. Right. When it came to grad school, I applied both to math departments and to uh, computer science departments. Ended up going to Stanford in computer science. So uh, math throughout Caltech principally, although you had yes. access to computer studies. There then. weren't really any computer science departments in the country at that point. They were just starting to be formed in the mid to late 60s. I think maybe Purdue was the first one. And mostly they started out as graduate programs. Right. In fact. Were you aware of um, Stanford of having particularly good training in um, computer science? Or are you still a Californian staying within California? How, how, how selective was your decision to go to Stanford? Uh, well, I applied to Stanford in computer science, Berkeley in math, Wisconsin in math, and Cornell in computer science, if I remember. So if you had only gotten into actually, the math programs, you would have I would have continued gone, as a math Well, person. yes, except the, what I've done throughout my career, you can think of as mathematics, but applied to computer science problems. Okay, so, okay. That was always kind of what I wanted to do. Although Stanford has a great reputation in artificial intelligence. So I kind of was thinking I would do the mathematical side of artificial intelligence, whatever that was. In a way, it was not having to make the choice, but doing applied mathematics in the context of the computer. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy I went into a computer science department, but I think I would have been also happy going to a math department. Mm -hmm. Um, there you are at Stanford, um, kind of the right place at the right time, if we look back at the history of these It, it was one of the good places to be in those days, right? yes. Um, tell me how you're formulating, or who is formulating for you, the study program in the still relatively young field. Uh, how is that being shaped? Uh, Back when I was in high school, I got interested in the four color problem. How can you color countries on a map so that any two countries touching have to be different colors? Mm -hmm. So this was a notorious unsolved problem at that point. It finally got solved in 1976 by Hawken and, and Appel, or Appel and Hawken. Uh, Appel's son actually is a professor in our department at Princeton. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was unsolved back when I was looking at it, and I was working on it, not with enough computational power and not with all the mathematical tools, but this was the sort of thing I was interested in. Yeah, but it was the in. task you were interested in. So it raised questions about planar graphs. Okay. It's planar graphs that you want to color, because a map is a planar right. object. And I, the summer before I went to Stanford, I was working at the Lawrence Livermore lab, actually. In my spare time, I did a lot of reading in automata theory and so on. So I was thinking about automata and complexity and so on. And I had this vague idea to go into artificial intelligence. I got to Stanford. I took lots of courses. Artificial intelligence was very fuzzy. It wasn't so clear how to combine it with mathematics. I talked to Michael Arbib, who was an automata theory professor in the double E department at Stanford, and he said, don't do automata theory. Do something more like complexity. And then Don Knuth was at Stanford, big algorithms guy. So, uh, And a kind of humanist, too. I mean, you got you got it all with him. I mean, as, that's as a, true, as that's a true. Amazing organ player, among yes. other things. So I took a Lisp programming course, symbolic programming with John McCarthy, and he gave us a final project. Uh, and there were choices, but one choice was given a graph, is it planar? Devise an algorithm to test whether a graph is planar or not. So I knew about planar graphs. I knew about Kurtowski's criterion, which is the mathematical way to resolve this question, but it doesn't produce a good algorithm. But I found an algorithm in the literature that I could 
program and I actually succeeded in doing the project and the people who tried that problem, I think I was the only one who came up with anything, huh. any good. So uh, after my first year, I had this exposure to planarity testing. Um, I had passed all my exams, so I was ready to do research. John Hopcroft came to Stanford on sabbatical. So he and I started talking about graph problems and graph algorithms and started exploring the idea of depth-first search and what one could do with it. I'm, and then I'm, things kind of exploded. I'm, I'm interested in the nature of collaboration in your field. So um, one seeks out the other because of an understanding of common interests. How, how did your, your working together come to happen? As I recall, we were in an office together and we just started talking about problems and I was interested in graph algorithms and he was interested in graph algorithms, so we just started bouncing ideas off each other. Computer science, I think, is a very collaborative field, um, more so maybe than mathematics. Right. Certainly, I really enjoy collaboration and it, it goes in different directions with different people. There's no right. one right path. But I you're think. clearly developing a, a solid intellectual relationship over a shared interest. Yes. At this point. Um, is this going to be the basis of your dissertation? Yes, yes, yes. So we explored depth first search on simpler problems. We figured out an algorithm to divide a graph into biconnected components, which means are there individual vertices whose removal breaks the graph into right. several pieces? Um, so then we looked at tri-connected components, and we looked at planarity testing, which turned out to be really hard. We came up with a not quite linear time algorithm, n log n time algorithm, where n is the number of vertices, and then I spent a long time, finally came up with a linear time algorithm for planarity, and that was the main part of my PhD it's probably thesis. probably sentimental to speak of a eureka moment, but essentially <laughs> that kind of a moment happens around a decision to publish. Are you publishing before you actually do the dissertation? Yes, because we, um, we did some of this work on depth through search. We were looking at graph isomorphism for planar graphs and various graph problems. Um, so we published some of the early work on depth first search while I was still a PhD student. The whole process were, went pretty fast though. I was only a student for two years and one quarter, something like that. Really? Nine quarters, which was the minimal residency requirement. So you were in graduate school for relatively a short time? Quite short. When is your doctorate? Given to you. January of 72. Okay. Can you describe for me the, uh, the state of knowledge in the fields you're about to enter full time uh, with a PhD at this point? What is, uh, what is known uh, and even about algorithms at this point as opposed to now? There were plenty of algorithms, but not a lot in the way of algorithmic analysis and it wasn't so clear what the right way to do analysis was. So one thing that John and I concentrated on was ignoring constant factors, getting the asymptotic growth rate, mm -hmm. and really worrying about efficiency. So Knuth, for example, really paid attention to constant factors and even second order terms and was looking at very exact and exacting bounds for algorithms, which is beautiful if you can actually get results, but is really tough to do. If you can um, pay a little less attention to the details, abstract things, go to a very simple computer model, random access machine, and just count steps and ignore constant factors, this turns out to be a very powerful way of looking at algorithms. So this was our point of view and then uh, there were plenty of algorithms, but no analysis, so the field was kind of wide open at the time. I mean, when I was at Stanford also, um, we didn't just look at graph algorithms, we looked at 
uh, selection. There's a wonderful story about, uh, well, it was a great environment because there were lots of Turing Award winners at Stanford. I spent a lot of time with Bob Floyd, who was my thesis advisor, and Knuth, and Hopcroft, and Dick Karp was at Berkeley, and uh, Gene Lawler was at Berkeley, and Manny Blum was at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And uh, Manny Blum came to visit talking about finding the median. So uh, given n numbers, you want to find the one that's in the middle. That is the one that's half of the numbers are smaller and half of the numbers are bigger. You can do it by sorting all the numbers and picking the one in the middle. That takes n log n time. Mm -hmm. And that's a lower bound if you're just doing binary comparisons. But can you do it faster? So. Manny had this idea for doing it faster, and he talked to Bob Floyd, and Rivest was Floyd's student, and various of us got talking together, and eventually we came with, with a linear time way to do it, so we ended up with a five-author paper. Von Pratt was on that paper, too. This he is the first there. time that this approach um, has been the linear approach has been solved, if you will? Nobody knew how to do it faster than sorting and then picking okay. out the middle okay. one. Yes, yes. So the game was to come up with algorithms that had faster running times asymptotically than previous algorithms. So, for example, in the planarity testing situation, the algorithm that I had implemented as a grad student was quadratic time, although the paper didn't say anything about the running time get it down to linear time was the best possible because you have to look at all the data and people were kind of amazed both at the fact that you could actually do it in linear time and what basically does that help us do I mean what's applications of planarity testing um, there are quasi applications I mean the justification is any linear circuit it's basically a planar graph. So if you want to lay out right. a linear circuit without crossings, it's a planarity testing problem. But it's more the tools and the techniques have many different applications. And if you can embed a graph in the plane, which our algorithm could do, it helps in doing other things like um, if you want to find shortest paths or flows between points in a planar graph, it helps to have an embedding. Um, I'm going to ask a, a broad question before I get you in your career to the next step, and that is uh, so often one sees, particularly mathematicians, but also uh, analytic computer scientists who are mathematicians, essentially, use terms like beautiful and elegant. <laughs> I love... Overused terms, but well, I have certainly maybe, but used it, them it too. It references something, because... If, if a solution is considered beautiful, there must be solutions that are considered not beautiful. Yes. So what, what is in general meant by that? Um, to s describe a, an algorithm as uh, beautiful or elegant? Yeah, beautiful is in the eye of the beholder. Elegant to me means simple but deep. So I will give you an example. Um, there's an algorithm that I've now been studying for 40 years or more, still studying, the disjoint set union algorithm, which solves a very simple problem. We're given a collection of singletons. We got two operations. They're going to get grouped together into sets, and the sets become bigger and bigger. So one operation is given elements in two sets, put the two sets together into one set. Second operation is given an element, find the set containing it. That's right. all. Lots of, this, this one has lots of applications, actually. So there's a beautiful data structure that uses trees and linking trees together, um, which has the property that the total running time is the number of operations times inverse Ackerman function. So what is inverse Ackerman? In the early 30s, when logicians were studying um, computation, computational models, what do you need to define universal computation? Turing machine is an example, but there are other ones. 
uh, uh, general recursive functions. This is another one that's equivalent to Turing machine. So Ackerman invented this function to show that primitive recursion, which is one variable recursion, is not sufficient to allow you to do all possible computations. You need multivariable right. recursion. So this Ackerman function generalizes, it, it diagonalizes over primitive recursive functions. So it's kind of like a hyper, hyper, hyper exponential. You can think of it that way. It grows incredibly fast. Right. The inverse function grows incredibly slowly. Constant for all practical purposes, but it grows a little bit. So this is something, so this algorithm has this inverse Ackerman function bound per operation. For all practical purposes, constant, but theoretically non-constant. Oh. Uh, this is an elegant algorithm. It's deep, it's simple, it's easy to program. The analysis and the, the actual running time comes out of left field wow. somehow. Oh, thank you, that's There's an example. I, I've always tried to produce simple algorithms because I mean, if you can put the analysis, the, put the complexity in the analysis, keep the algorithm simple, then people yes. will use it. Yes. People only use simple things, but it doesn't matter if the analysis is complex. You want the analysis to justify the simple idea. That's, that's my approach to this question of elegance. Um, you've gotten your PhD. Um, you have to make a decision, I'm thinking most computer scientists have to make this with their PhD in hand, and that is, do I go into industry or do I go into academics? Maybe that's a false um, decision, but tell me how you are thinking about your next step. Uh, yes, I think it's still true that that's the case. People have to, well, uh, so I applied to both sorts of places. I applied to universities. I also interviewed at IBM, Yorktown. Uh, it's possible that was the only industrial lab I interviewed at. I, I basically decided at that point I wanted to be in academia. I always thought of myself as a professor. So I applied on both sides, but then I took a university position. I ended up going to Cornell, followed Hopcroft back to Cornell. Was not prepared for the Ithaca winters, so I managed to survive for two winters in Ithaca. You are Southern California after all. <laughs> yes, well, so I got my PhD in January of 72. Actually, I could have been finished in September, and I had a job starting in September, but Bob Floyd, who was my PhD advisor, was a real stickler. He was very perfectionistic, so Stanford needed nine quarters of tuition, so I had to pay for the extra quarter anyway. He wanted changes in the thesis, so I ended up delaying going to Ithaca until second semester, which was January of 1972. I drove my fire engine red Mustang from Southern California, from LA, where my parents were, to Ithaca, New York. I get to Ithaca. What's this white stuff coming out of the sky? I'm sliding around on the roads. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Ithaca. So you're shocked, you're uh, climatically shocked. It was a great department, uh, great students, the climate was hard for me to take. Just for a moment, I'd like to talk about the department because now you're in another university, again at this cusp of computer uh, thinking. Um, are they well prepared? Have they committed to computational studies? It was a very strong department. It was yeah, strong department. Hopgrot was there, Hartmanis was there, okay. Uris Hartmanis, another Turing Award winner. He was the chair at the time it was definitely right. a really good So story. if it had not been for the snow, you might have stayed a while. Yes, yes, although Ithaca is also quite an isolated right. place, which somehow didn't make me. Okay, so we need to get you out of Ithaca. <laughs> well, I, so I, among other things, I had applied to Berkeley for a postdoc, which they gave me, and they would have, 
it would have taken me after six months at Cornell, but I thought that's that's not fair to Cornell. I should out. try again. So so I lasted another. I lasted a year and a half at Cornell, two winters. Mm -hmm. Then I took a postdoc at Berkeley. I think I may be the only person who's given up an assistant professor to take a postdoc. But yeah. Berkeley has these wonderful postdocs called Miller Fellowships, which are two-year positions, no responsibilities, no requirements, and the pay was the same as a uh, an assistant professor. Sure. I, I wasn't so concerned about money, so yes. uh, so I retreated from the winter after a year and a half. And what is Berkeley offering as an intellectual environment at this? Another great computer science mathematics environment. Again, Dick Karp is there, Gene yes. Lawler is there, amazing students. Freedom, California sunshine, right. Bay Area. So paradise. Uh, I'm going to again ask a very broad question which may not be very significant and that is the comparative vitality in your field of Berkeley versus Stanford. Stanford has gotten the, uh, the reputation as uh, the place that is generating the most uh, inquiry or maybe practical results. I don't know what, and Berkeley is solid, but, but Stanford is the better place to be. Is, is this remotely true at this point? Uh, well, after my first year at Berkeley, places started pinging me to join as a professor. So I got, Stanford made me an assistant professor offer and said I could delay for a year, finish my postdoc. Berkeley would have made me acting associate professor. I talked to a lot of people, they told me what you just told me, which is Stanford was a better place. Not so clear to me. I ended up going to Stanford, I had great students I loved Stanford as a grad student. Stanford as an assistant professor was maybe not so much fun mm -hmm. somehow, but it, this is a different answer than no, the question no, you it's asked. Me. Berkeley has a great computer science division, actually. Stanford is great, so is MIT. Right. And you can't there's, argue against and there's any interaction. Reason. Between yeah, there's a huge amount of interaction, actually. But Some, sometimes I think that had I stayed in Berkeley, I would have stayed in Berkeley forever, but it's ah. hard to know. Anyway, but I, you went, didn't. I went to, back you didn't. to Stanford. So, back to Stanford. Um, what, are you, what are you setting as your tasks, uh, your intellectual goals at this point? Uh, take the hammer of depth for a search and kill off any possible problem and explore all combinatorial problems that are susceptible to efficient algorithms, basically. Right. Just taking my toolbox and looking at interesting problems, trying to find problems that are important to which I could make some contributions. And in what did you make contributions? Well, I mentioned a few of them. We found lots of applications of depth first search. I, I analyzed the disjoint set union algorithm. I mentioned the inverse Ackerman function bound. That I actually finished up at Berkeley, but uh, one of my grad students at Stanford and I, Tom Lengauer, who's in Germany, uh, we devised an algorithm that used depth first search and has this, the idea of the disjoint set union data structure in it to solve a graph problem that got, that algorithm got built into pretty much all optimizing compilers that exist. And I worked on a bunch of other stuff too. I mean, it was, I had really good students. Um, one who deserves special mention, I think, is Danny Slater. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I've always been kind of eclectic in my choice of problems. So um, I got interested in network flow, finding a maximum flow in a graph with capacities. And turns out this problem, among many other graph problems, you can turn it into a data structure problem, which means that if you want to solve the problem efficiently, you need to figure out exactly what information you need to solve the problem and exactly how to represent it. 
and what kind of operations you need to do on that information so as to get the solution to the problem. You want the, the, the minimal data structure that supports the needed computation. So we worked on the network flow problem and it turns out the data structure you need is sort of dynamic trees. It's like the trees in the disjoint set union problem except instead of just hooking them together, mm -hmm. you have to be able to cut them apart too. So linking and cutting and keeping track of information basically. All right. So we invented a data structure to solve that problem. The we is you That's and Slater. Slater and me, yes. yeah. And in the process, we had to invent a particular kind of binary search tree to make this thing efficient. And I had another of my students got involved with that. That was Sam Bent. Uh, so we ended up with this very nice solution, but then, and then Danny went to Bell Labs after he graduated and we kept working together and thinking about what was going on. What is going on is you don't need to make every operation efficient. You're doing lots of operations so all that is required is that the total time of all the operations is somehow limited. This means you can afford an expensive operation if it's compensated for by cheap operations sooner or later. This thing happened with the disjoint set union problem. Individual operations are expensive, but they're balanced out by cheap operations. So we started studying this phenomenon um, uh, carefully and systematically. Uh, this led us to invest, uh, invent what is called the, the splay tree, which is a self-adjusting form of search tree in which there's no explicit balance condition. It's very simple. You do a lookup or insertion or deletion and then restructure the tree to make the item that you just looked for easier to access yes. later on, which is kind of like what happens in the disjoint set data structure. So very simple. We could prove all kinds of beautiful theorems about this thing. And that invention, eventually we got the Paris Conolacus Prize, Danny and I, mm -hmm. for that one. Um, for that specific? Yeah, because that data structure gets used a lot in practice because it adapts to match the behavior. It has this empirical property and we were able to prove nice properties of it. And there's still a beautiful open problem concerning that data structure. Right. Uh, I, um, I think you're going to toy with the idea of industry at some point in your career as well, although you're principally an academic. I'd like, because that's a different context in which to do research, um, how did you get, in the end, involved with industrial research? Uh, back in the late 70s, when I was a professor at Stanford, which was from about 75 to 1980, Right. Various people from Bell Labs came and visited. Ron, Grams, Ron Graham, uh, Mike Gary, Dave Johnson. Um, so I started collaborating with them and then they invited me to come consult at Bell Labs. So I started to have a fairly semi-regular consulting gig at Bell Labs when I was a And how is that different uh, from a, a, an academic context? You have both because you haven't yes. left academia, but... Um, well, eventually I ended up doing both. So what happened was I t went on sabbatical from Stanford to Bell Labs. Okay. Liked it so much I stayed. And then ever since I've had some connection on both sides. So it wasn't uh, like the snow shock of Ithaca. It wasn't a uh, cultural shock to go from a, an academic environment where I'm assuming you can roam at will in terms of problems you choose to solve to, again, I'm assuming, a corporate context where the company has certain goals for its research. Is that wrong? Well, Bell Labs in those days was a very special place, and we were in the mathematics research department at Bell Labs, and we were free to roam intellectually. So it was a, 
It was very much like a university environment. You didn't have to write grant proposals to raise money. You didn't have students, didn't have to teach, uh, but there were wonderful colleagues and visitors to collaborate with and summer interns and so on. So uh, from the point of view of intellectual activity and research, not so different in that place from being in a university. The managers were responsible for trying to get us to talk to people in the applied side and trying to bridge the gap and bring interesting problems in. And uh, mm -hmm. we were all interested in helping the company, but it wasn't a requirement. It was something that uh, Is this kind of emerged naturally based upon the personalities of the people involved, okay. I would say. So it was a rare environment. The phone company was a monopoly at that point. Bell Labs was fabulous. It's a pale shadow of its former self. Of course, it got broken up into many pieces. Right. Uh, IBM research at the time was similar. I think Microsoft research now has some aspects of that, although it's much more applied and focused in general in industrial labs these days. So it's not as great a transition as I might have imagined to go from, as I said, the academic context to a Bell Labs approach to research. That is correct, oh. yes, yes, yes. Are so, you tempted at all, not that you have to make the decision presumably, to stay in that universe or is it going to be a matter of time before you go back to the academy? Well, uh, what happened was I was at Bell Labs, so I went on sabbatical right. for a year and then they made me a very nice offer so I decided to stay, but I discovered that after a year, I was somehow losing my motivation for doing research, which was interesting. Mm. And somehow I attributed that to not interacting enough with young people, students. So I started teaching. I got an adjunct position at NYU in New York. Uh, in search of having students yeah, to teach. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I taught uh, one course, one one semester course every year for the next four years at NYU. Hmm. In the evening, hmm. I had one PhD student at NYU also, and then after five years I did another look around to try to think about something more permanent, shall we say. Well, what really happened was University of Texas had lots of oil money and they started dangling endowed chairs in front of people. So I interviewed there, but I thought if I'm interviewing here, I might as well interview many places. So I interviewed many places and ended up going to Princeton, but I retained a part-time position at Bell and now, Labs. And physically not so far in yeah. any case. So ever since I've been at Princeton, which is since 1985, I've had some kind of part-time industrial position. Okay. So it hasn't had to be, it have to be a choice. No, uh, that's you've right. Done both. Um, you, you've, again, on the sort of the broad subjects, You've also, in the course of your career, had a number of patents. Yes. Um, have they been patents that have led to specific results? or is this, Tell me the process of just wanting a patent for something and then what the consequence of having that patent has been. You could just take an instance among the many you've done. Uh, well, Large corporations like to have patents so they can trade them with other corporations so nobody gets in trouble, basically. So there's motivation for researchers to write patents. That's pretty much the only reason I've ever uh, done patents because the, it's a very strange legalistic process. It's much different from a scientific process. Uh, the one instance in which I had a patent that had some commercial significance was when I was working with at Intertrust, which was a digital rights management company. We were working on software self-defense. The, the issue being, you write a program, it's on your phone maybe, or it's, it, it's some place where the customer has access to the code but you're trying to protect the code. For example, you want to run a movie on your computer or your 
phone or something like that or an audio track. You want to make sure that the user doesn't hack the system so they can run the movie arbitrarily many times if, for example, they just rented it. How do you protect the code? So we devised a no number of strategies, methods for protecting code. We wrote a pretty large patent document and those ideas actually got embodied in technology that the company later later implemented. So one can also then conclude from that that security itself has been one of those questions that has interested you. This, this, yes. this is a solution yes. to the security issue. Yes, yes. I've spent time working in other areas besides data structures and algorithms and security is one. Um, some of the uh, interviews I've had the privilege of, of doing have um, poo-pooed the obsession with security, as though security was the problem of the future. That they, they didn't feel that. They feel it's overdone as a problem to be contemplated. Does that strike you as uh, sensible or surprising? It does not strike me as surprising. It is not necessarily sensible. I think security is a hard, really hard problem. And most systems, the internet, for example, was not designed with security in mind. And backfitting onto an unsecure system or insecure system, some kind of security mechanism is really tough. And we've seen the consequences, massive hacking attacks right. and so on. So security is only becoming more and more important, more and, more and more it is important. really a challenging Are you taking on that, problem. that issue these days? What are your A little bit. Factors? So my, my industrial tie at this point is back with inner trust. So among other things, I'm looking at some of their security technologies wow. and trying to help out. How are you guiding, guiding your students as they come to you, the, the, the good students no doubt you have, um, in terms of where they might invest their intellectual and professional energy at this point? Uh, well, my recommendation is pick a problem with some application or some consequences. Pick a problem that's important in real life, in an application area perhaps, that you can then, I mean, I'm a theoretician at heart, right? So my students, I want to see them prove theorems find an applied problem, abstract the essence of it, brew a theorem about it, or design an algorithm that can then be used in practice. Build the tie there. Do something that's relevant to somebody who actually wants to do something. That's, that's the message I try to convey. I can understand that as, as intellectual, even moral kinds, uh, but uh, are they ever asking you what are the fields and directions that seem that we're on the cusp of that an investment of their intellectual energy would put them in, in the mainstream, or is that exactly the wrong way to think? Well, sometimes I make suggestions, but I think it's, it's really up to the student to figure this out eventually. Okay, I'm going to take it away from students <laughs> and, ask, and ask you, as you look at the near future and longer term, where are the excitements, you think, and the, the next stage of takeoff? Because you've, you've said, as I've read, in your earlier stages, you had the advantage of being um, looking at problems and algorithms and so forth at a sufficiently early stage where there were lots of things to look into, lots of possibilities, uh, things were not so circumscribed. Is there any field or direction or topic these days that might give one a sense of being at the beginning of the uh, another revolution? At the busy, that's a strong statement, the beginning of another, another well, uh, everybody's all excited about big data, data analytics, the new kind of artificial intelligence, neural nets, so on and so forth. That's one direction to go. Sanjeev Arora, my colleague at Princeton, has certainly gone in the direction of studying neural nets. Um, very important, but I'm kind of reluctant to jump into hot topics. Computer science has this kind of, it's a very young field still. 
So there is a tendency for everybody to jump into the hot topic and try to mine it and then go on to the next hot okay. topic and mine it and so on. So my approach, and certainly now that I'm getting older and maybe running out of time here, is I really want to understand the fundamental problems. So there are problems that I've worked on off and on throughout my career that I still, still am problems. learning about. I mean, the thing about computers is they're really fast and they're getting faster and there's huge memory. There's a rich design space for algorithms. So there's plenty of room to play, even concerning problems that we have solutions for, but maybe they're not the best ones. So getting back to this notion of elegance, I would really like to find the nicest, the best, the most elegant solutions for problems that re people really care about. So I'm kind of concentrated on that. But to give another answer, most of the work I've done on algorithms has been sequential algorithms for random access machines. That's flat memory, uh, one step at a time. Two important abstractions which allowed us to do, get vast numbers of results. Uh, but computers now have multiple processors and they have memory hierarchies and there are communication issues and so on. So I've started looking at some of problems related to some of these more complex models. And if one thinks the design space for sequential algorithms is rich, it's incredibly rich and complicated once you start throwing some of these other ideas and even proving correctness of algorithms when there are multiple processes doing things because they interfere with each other. There's a scalability question. I think that's, in terms of theoretical research and how it impacts practicality, really understanding some of these issues I think is important. I think there's still open problems, even though people have been studying this stuff for a long time. So those are the directions. Thank you very much. You're welcome.